statistics, unlocking the power of data. These are all Harvard textbooks that are currently used in the Harvard curriculum. So this is a subject a lot of people don't like. There's a more fun book called Hacker's Delight. Which I'm not sure what it's about, but it's, it's, not, it's a suggested CS book. There's another book called Programming in C. There's another book called How Computers Work. These are the suggested books for CS50, Harvard's class. There's general chemistry. We have linear algebra with applications. Maybe we'll, I think Hacker's Delight looks pretty cool. So this reminds me of a book called Code by Petzold. When I first got a summer job at MIT's Project MAC almost 30 years ago, I was delighted to be able uh, to work with the DEC PDP-10 computer, which was more fun to program in assembly language than any other computer, bar none, because of its rich yet tractable set of instructions for performing bit tests, bit masking, field manipulation, and operations on integers. Though the PDP-10 has not been manufactured for quite some years, there remains a thriving cult of enthusiasts who keep old PDP-10 hardware running and who run old PDP-10 software, entire operating systems and their applications, by using personal computers to simulate the PDP-10 instruction set. They even write new software. There is now at least one web site with pages that are served up by simulated PDP-10. Come on, stop laughing. It's no sillier than keeping antique cars running. I also enjoyed in that summer of 1972 reading a brand new MIT research memo called HackMem, a bizarre and eclectic potpourri of technical trivia. The subject matter ranged from electric circuits to number theory, but what intrigued me most was its small catalog of ingenious little programming tricks. Each such gem would typically describe some plausible yet unusual operation on integers or bit strings, such as counting the one bits in a word, a word is a technical term, that could easily be programmed using either a longish fixed sequence of machine instructions or a loop, and then show how the same thing might be done much more cleverly, using just four or three or two carefully chosen instructions whose interactions are not at all obvious until explained or fathomed. For me, devouring these little programming nuggets was like eating peanuts, or rather bonbons. I just couldn't stop. And there was a certain richness to them, a certain intellectual depth, elegance, even poetry. Surely, I thought, there must be more of these. And indeed, over the years, I collected and in some case discovered a few more. There ought to be a book of them. I was generally thrilled when I saw Hank Warren's manuscript. He has systematically collected these little programming tricks, organized them thematically, and explained them clearly. While some of them may be described in terms of machine instructions, this is not a book only for assembly language programmers. The subject matter is basic structural relationships among integers and bit strings in a computer and efficient techniques for performing useful operations on them. These techniques are just as useful in the C or Java programming languages as they are in assembly. Why HackMem? Well, it's short for Hacks Memo. One 36-bit PDP-10 word could hold six 6-bit six characters, so a lot of the names PDP-10 hackers worked with were limited to six characters. We were used to glancing at a six-character abbreviated name and instantly decoding the contractions, so naming the memo HackMem made sense at the time, at least to the hackers. Many books and algorithms and data structure teach complicated techniques for sorting and searching, for maintaining hash tables and binary trees, for deleting, dealing with records and pointers. They overlook what can be done with very tiny pieces of data, bits and arrays of bits. It is amazing what can be done with just binary addition and subtraction and maybe some bitwise operations. The fact that the carry chain allows a single bit to affect all the bits to its left makes addition a peculiarly powerful, peculiarly powerful data manipulation operation in ways that are not widely appreciated. It's funny, when I learned the bitwise operators in JavaScript, I was confused as to why anybody would ever need such a thing. But you know, that's a, it's a different time and a different era. Yes, uh, there ought to be a book about these techniques. Now it's in your hands and it's terrific. If you write optimizing compilers or high performance code, you must read this book. You otherwise might not use this bag of tricks every single day, but if you find yourself stuck in some situation where you apparently need to loop over the bits in a word or to perform some operation on integers, it just seems harder to code than it ought, or you really need the inner loop of some integer or bit fiddly computation to run twice as fast, this is the place to look. Or maybe you'll just find yourself reading it straight through for, out of sheer pleasure. Guy Steele, Burlington Mass, 2002. Right, this is the preface. Caveat emptor, the cost of software maintenance increases with the square of the programmer's create creativity. First law of programming creativity, Robert Bliss, 1992. This is a collection of small programming tricks that I've come across over many years. Many of them will work only in computers that represent integers in two's complement form. Although a 32-bit machine is assumed when the register length is relevant, most of the tricks are easily adapted to machines with other register sizes. Oh boy, this is complicated. This book does not deal with large tricks such as sophisticated sorting and compiler optimization techniques. Rather, it deals with small tricks that usually involve individual computer words 
or instructions, such as counting the number of one bits in a word. Such tricks often use a mixture of arithmetic and logical instructions. It is assumed throughout that integer overflow interrupts have been masked off so they cannot occur. C, Fortran, and even Java programs run in this environment, but Pascal and Ada users beware. The presentation is informal. Proofs are given only when the algorithm is not obvious, and sometimes not even then. The methods use computer arithmetic, floor functions, mixtures of arithmetic and logical operations, and so on. Proofs in this domain are often difficult and awkward to express. To reduce typos, many of the algorithms have been executed. This is why they're given in a real programming language, even though, like every computer language, it has some ugly features. C is used for the high-level language because it's widely known. It also the straightforward mix of integer and bit string operations, and C compilers that produce high-quality object code are available. Occasionally, machine language is used, employing a three-address format, mainly for the ease of readability. The assembly language used is that of a fictitious machine that is representative of today's RISC computers, reduced instruction set code. Branch-free code is favored. Because in most computers, branches slow down instruction fetching and inhibit ex ex executing instructions in parallel. Another problem with branching is that they can inhibit compiler optimization, such as instruction scheduling, commenting, and register allocation. That is, the compiler may be more effective at these optimizations with a program that consists of a few large basic blocks rather than many small ones. The code sequences also tend to favor small, immediate values, comparisons to zero rather than to some other number, and instruction-level parallelism. Although much of the code would become more concise by using table lookups for memory, this is not often mentioned. This is because loads are becoming more expensive relative to arithmetic instructions, and the table lookup methods are often not very interesting, although they are often practical. But there are exceptional cases. Finally, I should mention that the term hacker in the title is meant in the original sense of an aficionado of computers, someone who enjoys making computers do new things or do old things in a new and clever way. The hacker is usually quite good at his, his craft, his or her craft, but may very well not be a professional computer programmer or designer. The hacker's work may be useful or may be just a game. As an example of the latter, more than one determined hacker has written a program which, when executed, writes out an exact copy of itself. This is the sense in which we use the term hacker. If you're looking for tips on how to break into somebody else's computer, you won't find them here. One such program written in C is main car star p equals main car star p, some escape characters, void print f, void print f. So I don't know old C that well. I forgot what the, what the asterisk operator in old C does. Let's take a look. Well, obviously, it's, it's a multiplier, but for dereference operator, I, I think one decent goal is to understand this program. We will try to understand this program maybe now, maybe at a later date, but I think this would be pretty interesting. I mean, it just seems to print out um, pretty simple. It just prints out uh, P, and P is this thing. So that's the basic sense of it, right? It's a, it's a string, right? So it's like it used to have to like car 10 or something like that. You used to have to enumerate how many, how many like a string is actually just a, a, an array of cars in old C, if I recall correctly. All right, first I want to thank Bruce Shriver and Dennis Allison for encouraging me to follow this book. And indebted to many colleagues at IBM, several of whom are cited in bibliography. Martin Hopkins, who I think of as Mr. Compiler at IBM, has been relentless in his drive to make every cycle count. And I'm sure some of the spirit has rubbed off on me. Guy Steele completed a 50-page review that includes new subject areas to address, such as bit shuffling and unshuffling, the sheep and the goats operation, and many others. He suggests the algorithms that beat the ones I used. He was extremely thorough. For example, I had erroneously written that the hexadecimal number AAAA -A 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 factors as 2 times 3 times 17 times 257 times 65537. Guy pointed out that the 3 should be 5. He suggested improvements et cetera, et cetera. Wherever you see parallel prefix in this book, the material is due to Guy. All right, so this is uh, Yorktown, New York, where IBM is still located. All right, let's have some fun. Chapter one, introduction. One, one, notation. This book distinguishes between mathematical expressions of ordinary arithmetic and those that describe the operation of a computer. In computer arithmetic, operands, it's not a word that's not used that much, but it's still fundamental. Operands are bit strings or bit vectors of some defined fixed length. Expressions in computer arithmetic are similar to those of ordinary arithmetic, but the variables denote the contents of the computer registers. The value of a computer arithmetic expression is simply a string of bits with no particular interpretation. An operator, however, interprets its operands, right? These are arguments for the operator. 
So if you have, quite simply, really, really easy stuff, 2 times 3, the multiplication is the operator, and these are the operands. Right? And I just think sometimes we want to be able to refer to this language abstractly or generally. And there are specific subtypes of operands such as right, a variable. What's, what's the operand like this? What do we call that? Sometimes called a static? Or maybe another better word for it? Is there subtypes of operands? We can pass a lot of operands to an operator. So just getting this semantics down. All right. For example, a comparison operator, what's a comparison operator? Greater than, less than, equal, or equal, equal, might interpret its operand as signed binary integers or as unsigned binary integers, positive or negative, right? Our computer arithmetic notation uses distinct symbols to make the type of comparison clear. The main difference between computer arithmetic and ordinary arithmetic is that in computer arithmetic, the results of addition, subtraction, multiplication are reduced modulo 2 to the n. What does that mean? Where n is the size of the word in the machine. So I think we're referring to binary um, math here. Another difference is that computer arithmetic includes a large number of operations. In addition to the four basic arithmetic operations, computer arithmetic includes logical and Includes the logical and, exclusive or, x or, compare, shift left, and so on. Unless specified otherwise, the word size is 32 bits, and side integers are represented in two's complement form. So these are all, depending on how you look at them, advanced or basic um, stuff in computing. Expressions of computer arithmetic are written similarly to those of ordinary arithmetic, except that the variables denote the contents of the registers are in boldface type. This convention is commonly used in vector algebra. We regard a computer word as a vector of single bits. Constants also appear in boldface type when they denote the contents of a computer register. This has no analogy with vector algebra because in vector algebra, the only way to write a constant is to display the vector's components. When a constant denotes part of an instruction, such as the immediate field of a shift instruction, like face type is used. If an operator such as plus or addition has boldface operands, then the operator denotes that the computer's addition operation, vector addition. If the operands are like face, then the operator denotes the ordinary scalar, by the way, that's the word I was looking for here. These are scalars. We use a lightface variable x to denote the arithmetic value of the boldfaced variable x under an interpretation, signed or unsigned, that should be clear from the context. Thus, if x equals 0x, 8000000, and y equals the same, then under signed integer interpretation, x equals y equals negative 2 to the 31st x plus y equals negative 2 to the 32nd, and x plus y equals 0. Here, x, 0x, 8000000 is hexadecimal notation for a bit string containing, consisting of a 1 bit followed by 31 0 bits. Hope you get that. I don't. Bits are numbered from the right, with the rightmost least significant bit being bit 0. The term bits, nibbles, bytes, half words, words, and double words refer to lengths 1, 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64 bits. So this was my favorite word growing up studying computers. Nibbles. Nibble is, is half a byte. Because, you know, a byte is a big byte, so a nibble is half a byte, right? What's smaller than a byte? A nibble. Short and simple sections of code are written in computer algebra using its assignment operator, the left arrow, and occasionally an if statement. In this role, computer algebra is serving as little more than a machine-independent way of writing assembly language code. Programs too long or complex for computer algebra are written in the C programming language as defined by the ISO 1999 standard. A complete description of C would be out of place in this book, but Table 1.1 contains a brief summary of most of the elements of C that are used herein. This is provided for the benefit of the reader who is familiar with some of the procedural programming language but not with C. Table 1.1 also shows the operators of our computer algebraic arithmetic language. Operators are listed from highest precedence, or tightest binding, to lowest. In the precedence column, well, L means left associative. So if you have two operators, they'll associate the two first two operands. And right means right associative, which will do the opposite. Our computer algebraic notation follows C in precedence and associativity. In addition to the notations described in 1.1, those of Boolean algebra and standard mathematics are used in explanations where necessary. So let's look at this, the expressions of C in computer algebra. 
If this doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. So here's logical not. I recognize this immediately. This is arithmetic negation, very simple. So not just reverses a 0 to 1 or a 1 to 0. This is a bitwise not, which is different. <laughs> this is the ones complement. So this is just one bit. Uh, we have an exponent. Type conversion, so this is coercion of type pre-increment and uh, pre-increment, so and decrement, post-increment and decrement. Um, so this is familiar in most languages. You have the negative of the absolute value. So take the absolute value and, and make a negative. You have the absolute value. But the absolute value of negative 2 to the 31st is still negative 2 to the 31st. Okay. We have functions, which are the highest binders, and different variables are bit selection, and the kth component of a, an array, and then hexadecimal and binary constants, which are the highest precedence. And we get to lower and lower precedence. We have multiplication and division. We have signed integer division, unsigned integer division. We have uh, multiplication, which is modulo the word size. We have modulo or, or remainder. Uh, let's see, again, remainder x reduced modulo of y, addition, subtraction. Now we have the confusing ones, shifts. So shift left, shift right, which we'll need to explain some other time. Sign comparisons, pretty simple. Is something bigger than or less than? Is it equal to? Double equals is equal to. Equals is the, is the assignment uh, operator, which will, or yes, operator, which we'll get to in a second. Bitwise exclusive bitwise equivalence, bitwise or. So this is different from these comparison operators. Conditional and, conditional or, concatenate, and here's assignment, which is the lowest precedence. Keep that in mind. Assignment has the lowest precedence. Our computer algebra uses other functions in addition to absolute, remainder, and so on. These are defined when introduced. In C, the expression x less than y less than z means to evaluate x less than y to a 0, 1 valued result, a binary, a boolean, I should say, and then compare that result to z. In computer algebra, this expression means x is less than y and y is less than z. C is three control loop statements, while doing four. The while statement is while this statement. The first expression is evaluated. If it's true, statement is executed and control returns to evaluate it again. If it's false, the while loop terminates. So do is similar, except the test is at the end. And four has a, you know, the typical four um, structure. So I don't know why I'm skipping this uh, so quickly, but this is a lot of fun because I wanted to get to here, which is the instruction set. And again, this is very technical um, stuff. This is not the um, required textbook for CS50. This is a suggested reading. Um, again, this is uh, basically machine code uh, and how to um, go through machine code. So I was going, I guess I was going through that table quickly because I didn't want to belabor every little piece of the table, even though it is probably pretty important. Um, so I'll just finish this chapter and we can close this book and we can say at least that we read chapter one, right? All right, C has three loop control statements, while, do, and for. The while statement is written, while expression, do this statement. So first you evaluate the expression. If it's true, the statement is executed, and the control returns to evaluate the expression again. So that's why it's a loop. And if the expression is false, the loop is over. The do statement is similar, except the, the, the uh, test is at the bottom. So you do do this statement while this is true. So the statement is executed first. So the difference between do and while is you guarantee at least one statement execution in do. Uh, then you evaluate the expression. If it's true, the process is repeated, and if it's false, um, the loop will terminate. The for statement, which we've all hopefully written one for statement in our life, um, takes these three variables. So you have E1, which is the assignment statement. Um, so usually you assign like some counter uh, for i equals one or zero or whatever. E2 is the, is the comparison. So this is the kind of like test. So as long as i is less than n, this bunch of code will continue. And then at the end of it all, add one to i. So this way at least I will start to approach n. It may approach it quickly, it may approach it um, slowly, but it will approach it um, at some point. And there are plenty of examples. I have I mean, just a simple um, formula in here, and you can see already a couple of for loops. So for loops have never really have been around for, for the test of time, since the test of time. 
This is one of the few contexts in which we use the post increment operator. The ISO C standard does not specify whether right shifts, this is the right shift operator, of sign quantities are zero propagating or sign propagating. This is very advanced, low level computer programming, which is not really done these days anymore, at least for mo most people. In the C code herein, it is assumed that if the left operand is signed, then a sign propagating shift results. And if it is unsigned, then a zero propagating shift results following ISO. Most standard C compilers work this way. It is assumed that left shifts are logical. Some machines, mostly older ones, provide an arithmetic left shift in which the sign bit is retained. Another potential problem with shifts is that the ISO C standard specifies that if the shift amount is negative or is greater than or equal to the width of the left operand, the result is undefined. But nearly all 32-bit machines treat shift amounts module 32 or 64. The code herein relies on one of these behaviors. An explanation is given when the distinction is important. All right, this is the cool part. Section 1-2, chapter 1-2, instruction set and execution time model. To permit a rough comparison of algorithms, we imagine them being coded for a machine with an instruction set similar to that of today's general purpose risk computers, such as the IBM RS6000, the Oracle Spark, and the ARM architecture. The machine is three address and has a fairly large number of general purpose registers, that is 16 or more. Unless otherwise specified, the registers are 32 bits long. General register zero contains a permanent zero, and the others can be used uniformly for any purpose. In the interest of simplicity, there are no special purpose registers, such as a condition register or a register to hold status bits, such as overflow. The machine has no floating point instructions. Floating point is only a minor topic in this book, being confined to chapter 17. We recognize two varieties of risk, a basic risk having the instructions shown in 1.2 and a full risk, having all the instructions of the basic risk plus those in 1.3. So what's basic risk? I used to be infatuated with this stuff as a kid because um, the video game systems I played on had risk chips. And I always wanted to know what, what exactly was a risk chip. So here are the opcodes, add, sub, mul, div, div u, rem, and rem u. These sound pretty obvious, what's what they are. The operands they take, rt, ra, and rb. So rt, ra, op, rb, where op is add, subtract, multiply, divide, sign, divide, unsigned, remainder, unsigned, or remainder, remainder signed, or remainder unsigned. So ra, op, rb will give you rt, addi, and muli. Op is add or multiply, and I is a 16-bit signed immediate value. Add is, this is a shift, and or, or XOR, I'm confused by what, what this is. I think you're adding a immediate signed value, but I'm not sure. Uh, so this is bitwise and or, or XOR. This is a same thing, except one of the operands is an unsigned immediate value. Here are some more uh, BEQ, BNE, BLT, BLE, BGT, or BGE. These are branches. So um, BT and BF are branches as well. Branch true, branch false. That's what branch equals, less than, greater than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to branch not equal to. So these are like if statements. <laughs> How would you like to program like this? Uh, now we have CMP, EQ, CMP, and E, LT, LE, GT, GE, LTU, LEU, GTU, and GEU. These are again comparisons. comparisons. Compare for equality, inequality, less than, and so forth. So these are really old assembly um, tools. See, compare again, um, except there's a 16-bit signed immediate value. Compare again, except uh, there's a second uh, comparand. I love that word. Not an operand, but a comparand. Phew. All right, this is loading uh, into a memory location or register. Here's a uh, multiplication again. Here's not. Here's the shift. The shift, uh, I guess, what are we calling these again? opcodes, and then uh, store into memory. All right, so in these tables, RA and RB appearing as source operands really means the contents of those registers. A real machine would have branch and link for subroutine calls, 
branch to the address container register for subroutine returns and switches, and possibly some instructions for dealing with special purpose registers. It would, of course, have a number of privileged instructions and instructions for calling on supervisor services. It might also have floating point instructions. Some other computational instructions that a risk computer might have are identified in 1.3. Those are discussed in later chapters. It is convenient to provide the machine's assembler with a few extended mnemonics. These are like macros, whose expansion is usually a single instruction. Some possibilities are in 1.4. The load immediate instruction expands into one or two instructions, as required by the immediate value i. For example, if 0 is less than or equal to i, which is less than or equal to 2 to the 16th, and or immediate, ORI, from R1 can also be used. If less than, if negative 2 to the 15th is less than or equal to i, less than zero, and add immediate from R0 can be used. If the rightmost 16 bits of I are zero, add immediate shifted, A-D-D-I-S. That's add immediate shifted, now I understand. Can <coughs> um, be used. Otherwise, two instructions are required, such as add immediate shifted followed by or I. Alternatively, in the last case, a load from memory can be used, but for execution time and space estimates, we assume that two elementary arithmetic instructions are used. Of course, which instructions belong in the basic risk and which belong in full risk is very much a matter of judgment. Quite possibly, divide, unsigned, and remainder instructions should be moved to full risk. Conversely, conversely possibly, load, possibly load byte signed should be in the basic risk category. It is in the full risk side because it's probably of rather low frequency of use, and because in some technologies it is difficult to propagate a sign bit through so many positions and still make cycle time. The distinction between basic and full risk involves many other questionable judgments, but we don't need to dwell on them. The instructions are limited to two storage registers and one target, which simplifies the computer. The register file requires no more than two read ports and one write port. It also simplifies an optimizing compiler, because the compiler does not need to deal with instructions that have multiple targets. The price paid for this is that the program that wants both the quotient and remainder of two numbers, which is not uncommon, must execute two instructions, divide and remainder, and this still plagues JavaScript and C to this day. The usual machine division algorithm produces the remainder as a byproduct, so many machines make them both available as a result of one execution of divide. Similar remarks apply to obtaining the double word products of two words. The conditional move instructions, move Q, ostensibly have two, only two source operands, but in a sense they have three. Because the result of the instruction depends on the values of RT, RA, and RB, the machine executes instructions out of order. A machine that executes instructions out of order must treat RT in these instructions as both a use and a set. That is, an instruction that sets RT followed by a conditional move that sets RT must be executed in that order, and the result of the first instruction cannot be discarded. Thus, the designer of such a machine may elect to omit the conditional move instructions to avoid having to consider an instruction with logically three source operands. On the other hand, conditional move instructions do save branches. Instruction formats are not relevant for the purposes of this book, but the full risk instruction set described above with floating point and a few supervisory instructions added can be implemented with 32-bit instructions on a machine with 32 general purpose registers, five-bit register fields. By reducing the immediate fields of compare, load, store, and trap instructions to 14 bits, the same holds for a machine with 64 general purpose registers. Wow, six bit register fields. All right, execution time. We assume that all instructions execute in one cycle, except for the multiply, divide, and remainder instructions, for which we do not assume that any particular execution time. Branches take one cycle, whether they branch or fall through. The load immediate instruction is counted as one or two cycles, depending on whether one or two elementary arithmetic instructions are required to generate the constant in a register. Although load and store instructions are not often used in this book, we assume they take one cycle and ignore any load delay, a time lapse between when a load instruction completes in the arithmetic unit and when the requested data is available for a subsequent instruction. However, knowing the number of cycles used by all the arithmetic and logical instructions is often insufficient for estimating the execution time of a program. Execution can be slowed substantially by load delays and by delays in fetching instructions. These delays, although very important, are increasing in importance and are not discussed in this book. Another factor, one that improves execution time, is what is called instruction-level parallelism, which is found in many contemporary risk chips, particularly those for high-end machines. These machines have multiple execution units and sufficient instruction dispatching capability to execute instructions in parallel when they are independent, that is, when neither uses the result of another, and they don't both set the same register or status bit. Because this capability is now quite common, the presence of independent operations is often pointed out in this book. Thus, we might say that such and such formula can be coded in such a way that it requires eight instructions and executes in five cycles on a machine with unlimited instruction level parallelism. This means that if the instructions are arranged in a proper order or scheduled, a machine with sufficient number of adders, shifters, logical units, and registers can, in principle, execute the code in five cycles. We don't make too much of this because machines differ greatly in their instruction level parallelism capabilities. For example, an IBM RS6000 processor 
from around 1992 has a three input adder and can execute two consecutive add type instructions in parallel, even when one feeds another. In other words, in add feeding a compare or the base register of a load. As a contrary example, consider a simple computer, possibly for low cost embedded application that has only one read port on its register file. Normally this machine would take an extra cycle to do a second read of the register file for an instruction that has two register input operands. However, suppose it has a bypass so that if an instruction feeds an operand of the immediately following instruction, then that operand is available without reading the register file. On such a machine, it is actually advantageous if each instruction feeds the next. That is, if the code has no parallels. Okay, can you express the for loop in terms of a while loop? Can it be expressed as a do loop? That's another very interesting question. This is basic computer science. Code a loop in C in which the unsigned integer control variable i takes on all the values from 0 to and including the maximum unsigned number 0 x f f f f f f f f on a 32-bit machine. For the more experienced reader, the instructions of the basic and full risks defined in this book can be executed with at most two register reads and one write. What are some of the common or plausible risk instructions that either need more source operands or need to do more than one register write? Cool. So that is the introduction. Um, there's some extended mnemonics here I want to go through really quickly. 1-3 is full risk, so we have absolute and negative absolute. We have bitwise uh, and uh, with a complement, uh, equivalence, negation, uh, and, or negative, or nand, not and, or negate and, and or, and or with complement. We have bit extraction, bit extraction with sign fill. We have insertion. We have number of leading zeros, NLZ. We have pop, uh, just how many one bits are in something. Uh, we have loading a sign byte. We have move if there's equal or other conditionals. We have shifts, more shifts with uh, uh, certain amounts. And we have trap if there's a certain situation or conditional and other traps. And then we have this little extended mnemonic, which is an unconditional branch, load immediate, move, which is, this is a very common, uh, very, very common assembly instruction. Move register RA to RT, so this takes two operands. Negate with two's complement and subtract immediate. So that's chapter one of this book. It's called Hacker's Delight. It's a suggested reading for CS50, which is the Harvard undergraduate course. There are three suggested readings. This is just one of them. Um, I hope you enjoyed that.